The Emmy-nominated Netflix series Orange is the New Black is based on the true story of Piper Kerman, a beautiful blonde college graduate who spent a year in prison after being convicted of money laundering and drug smuggling for a scheme she got tangled up in 10 years earlier. Piper Kerman joins us now in Williams Hall. Piper, welcome to the studio. Welcome to Miami. Thank We're you. so glad it's to nice have you. To be here. I'm delighted to be here. So, just the series is a hit, the television Netflix series right now, and it all started with you. What, uh, what inspired you to write this memoir, and what fulfillment have you gotten from it? Well, I, I came home from prison in 2005. I had spent 13 months of my life there. Uh, I was lucky it wasn't longer. And what I found behind the walls of prison was very different than what I expected. And I think the things that I experienced and the things that I observed were often things that shocked me or in some cases outraged me. Um, after I came home from prison, I decided to write about my own experience. And what I hoped is that first and foremost, I might be able to get someone to pick up a book about prison who would not otherwise read a book about prison. I hoped that that would be true. And uh, I hope that readers would come away from the book with a different idea about who's in prison in this country. And we have the biggest prison population in human history in the United States. No society has ever locked away so many of its citizens. Uh, and why are folks there? What are the pathways that people follow into prison? And what really happens behind the walls of a prison or a jail? Now, your first day in prison was nothing like you expected. I heard you talk about it before. Can you kind of tell us about what that day was like for you when you entered the prison? When I self-surrendered, you know, I turned myself in to begin serving my sentence. I was very frightened. Uh, our, our image of prison and of prisoners is of uncontrollable violence, and so I was very scared of violence. And you know the correctional officers who processed me into the prison, you know, didn't do anything to uh, allay those fears. They make it a really scary experience. And so um, I was put into general population in the unit there I would live in for most of the time that I was in prison. And I was there with you know hundreds and hundreds of women, and I knew none of them. And the idea that I would be able to trust them. The idea that they would help me, the idea that I would experience kindness at the hands of other prisoners was the furthest thing from my mind. Mm -hmm. But even by the time that I had gone to bed that night, I knew that this experience was going to be very different than what I imagined. And so I thought I would keep my mouth shut and my eyes open. Yeah. When talk of a Netflix series came about, what was your reaction to it? And did you ever think it would get this type of traction that it had? Well, uh, the book came out in 2010, mm -hmm. and I was so grateful that it found readers. And one of the readers that it found was a woman named Genji Cohan, who is the woman who created the show Weeds. And before that, she was a writer on The Gilmore Girls, and you know, she's had a long career in television. Um, and she's very bright, and she's very unusual, and she's very creative. And so, you know, someone said, "Oh, Genji loves your book." And you know, would you be willing to meet with her? So we had a fascinating lunch, and it really all began with that relationship. You know, Genji and her interest in the book and her excitement about creating this world of women behind bars. And so then Netflix came into the picture, and mm -hmm. and things moved actually much more quickly than I think anyone expected. Um, and I couldn't be more delighted with the results. You know, they did a great job. Yeah. All right. Well, without further ado, we have a audience full of journalists that are willing to ask questions. So we'll start with the first one. Hi, I'm Dinah Bukert from Lakota Spark News Magazine. And I was wondering, what was the hardest thing for you to let go from your normal life as you transitioned into prison life? I think the hardest thing for anybody in prison is the separation from their family and from their friends and from the people who love them and the people who rely on them. That is definitely the greatest sense of loss. Um, because you need those folks, and also those folks need you, and you can't be there for them in a substantive way. Hi, I'm Casey Mecker with Her Campus, and my question is, what do you think prevents other prisoners from speaking out about the injustice they experience in the prison? I think that, um, especially when people are in prison, uh, they're very, very powerless, which is interesting to think about, because of course, you know, everyone fears crime, and thinks of people who commit crimes as these incredibly powerful, powerful, menacing people. 
And yet prisoners are very powerless in many ways. And it's very hard for prisoners to get justice from the systems that supervise them. So when thing, terrible things happen to people, sometimes behind bars, they're raped, they're otherwise abused, it's very difficult for folks to uh, get recognition of those kinds of abuses or traumas um, from the systems that, that are actually responsible for those traumas. Um, once people come home from prison, the majority of people who are in our prisons and jails come from our poorest and most vulnerable communities. So most people have very pressing survival concerns once they come home from prison and jail. Hi, Piper. I'm Sarah Emery from the Miami University Writing um, for Scholars in Media, Writing for Media Scholars program. Um, you actively work with the Women's Prison Association. What would you cite as the greatest success with the WPA since you joined their board of directors? Well, the thing that is most exciting during the short time since I joined the board of directors, you know, the, the Women's Prison Association has been around since 1840. It is the longest running organization that works with criminal justice involved women in the country. Um, but since I have been on the board, um, we do lots of really important work and most of our work is in New York where I live. Um, but the really exciting new program that we launched last fall is a program called Justice Home. And Justice Home is a program for women who are facing at least a year in prison and with the cooperation and permission of the district attorney who has prosecuted their case, those women get to serve their sentence at home. They are supervised at home in their community, usually with their children, almost all of them have kids, uh, rather than being sent away to prison or jail. And if they complete that program successfully, they have a chance at expungement of their criminal record, which is really important because even if you're not in prison or jail, a felony conviction is something that creates many barriers to participating as a full citizen. Hi, Emily Tate with the Miami Student. Um, your show is very popular among Miami students, but I'm not sure how many have gotten the chance to read your book. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the most important difference between the reality and the TV portrayal of your time in prison? Oh. Well, Janji said something really interesting to me early in the process of shooting the show. Uh, she said it very casually at lunch. She said, I love your book so much, but it just doesn't have that much conflict in it. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but now I do understand that better now that we've been through you know, two seasons. Uh, filmed entertainment, you know, a television series, really relies on external conflict, conflict between people, fights, you know, romance, all those things. A book is introspective and sheds light on internal conflict in a way that is very difficult for a TV show or a movie to ever do. And so um, a TV show that was as introspective or internal as a book could be would probably be really slow to watch. Uh, and frankly, a book that had as much conflict as a, the typical TV series does would probably be unreadable. So they're very different in terms of that sort of tone and some of the things that they delve into. AJ Reed from Lakota East Spark. Um, what is the main thing you would want to take away from prison? I think the main thing that I hope someone come, takes away from uh, reading my book or from watching the show is a sense that putting people in prison or jail doesn't really create the change that we want to see in our society. That they are institutions that don't really create change for people. Um, they they force all kinds of things on the people who live inside of prisons and jails, but there's not a lot of rehabilitation or um, productive work being done in most prisons and jails. And so that really differs from what we often expect of prisons and jails, right? We, we think of punishment, but we also do think of rehabilitation, and that is really absent in most American prisons and jails. Ivana Jang, also from Lakota East High School. Um, do you agree with the creative liberties that the TV adaption takes with your story? I think that um, the show makes a lot of departures from the true story that is told in the book. But the thing that is most important is that they keep the world of Litchfield Prison a realistic world. Um, because really weird stuff happens in prison or jail really weird and so they have a lot of license to create truly crazy storylines as long as it's grounded in the reality of what day-to-day -day life in prison is like um, 
you know, day-to-day -day life in prison can be extremely tedious, but it can also be extremely dramatic. And um, the departures from my own personal story don't bother me at all. Hi, I'm Emily with WMSR News. Um, since your testimony before the Senate in February, how have you seen Congress push um, oversight of correctional facilities nationwide, and do you think that they're doing a good job right now? I think that uh, that Senate hearing for the Senate subcommittee, the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Civil Rights, Human Rights, and the Constitution was focused on solitary confinement which is the most extreme punishment that we inflict on people other than a punishment of death. We have an estimated 80,000 people in solitary confinement in this country, which is a huge number. And people often land in solitary confinement for really minor infractions, and mentally ill people are more likely to be put in solitary confinement, which has catastrophic effects on them. Um, I am optimistic that more attention is being paid to questions like solitary confinement and other really extreme punishments or in some case abuses in prisons and jails. So just today, you know, on Rikers Island, which is one of the three biggest jails in the country in New York where I live, they announced that they would stop putting children in solitary confinement. <coughs> now, people may be shocked to hear that we put solid children in solitary confinement in the first place but it definitely is progress to stop doing that because if there's one group of people who don't belong in solitary, it's kids. So I, I am hopeful that a lot more attention is being paid to these issues. There's a lot of issues to pay attention to. I think the name of the game is trying to put fewer people in prison and jail in the first place because then we have a better prospect at making them more effective and more humane institutions. Hi, Olivia with Greenhawks Media. Um, in your book, you write a lot about how you and even some of the other prisoners were kind of hesitant about leaving, and I was wondering what was the biggest adjustment to life after prison? So prison, the, the life of that institution really does dominate your life, and it, you have a very steep learning curve to learn how to become a prisoner, and then suddenly you're faced with release, and for a lot of people, they're facing a lot of uncertainty once they're released from prison. Um, unlike me, they may not have a job waiting for them when they return home, as an example. Um, I had a much easier reentry than most of the 700,000 people who come home from prison and jail every single year in this country because I had a safe and stable place to live, because I had a job, because I had, you know, that job had health care, all of these sort of very basic things that people need to be concerned about and focus on. Um, Mark Jarvis from the Cody Spark here. Um, did you ever have doubts that they uh, wouldn't be able to pull off such a complex story? Uh, in adapting the show? Yes. Yes. In adapting the show, um, I think that's the great thing about it being a series as opposed to being a film. And so, you know, some people were like, oh, wouldn't you rather have a movie? And I think a series really gives you the opportunity to dig very deep into these characters' lives. And so we see that in the series when they show the backstories, when they show each of these women's personal histories. And also they delve into you know, what is actually happening in Litchfield Prison with great complexity. It would be really hard to do that in a film because films really reduce it to a single protagonist and whatever that person's struggle is. But the really nice thing about the show is that it shows many, many different struggles, the struggles of all the women in that prison and, and some of the people who work there as well. Um, you know, Genji, I have I had a lot of confidence in Genji. I think she's extremely creative. I think she's so smart. I think she uses humor as her analytic tool, you know, to sort of uh, approach these themes and these questions. And I think they've done a great job. Hi. My name is Rachel. I'm with um, Inkling's Literary Magazine on campus. Um, I'm curious about, I think feminists have really latched onto the show, and I want to know like, what you think about that and maybe how your time in prison affected your relationship with that movement. Hmm. I think, you know, I was, I was raised to be a feminist. <laughs> I can't even uh, credit anyone other than my parents. My mother and my father you know, instilled all of those senses of equality really from a very young age. So. Feminism was never really a question mark in my own life, um, more like a given. Um, it's hard to imagine a less equal relationship than the relationship between a correctional officer or another prison staffer and a prisoner. 
And so in a women's prison where most of the people who run those prisons are men, those gender, pa gender and power relationships are really stark. Um, you also, of course, in a prison find mostly people who come from the poorest and most vulnerable communities. And so if you're a feminist, you have to think really seriously about the differences in opportunity that some women have in our society versus other women. And those are really on display in the criminal justice system. I think as far as the show goes, it's amazing to see uh, so many female protagonists from such a variety of backgrounds, uh, such different stories, and yet someone to root for. Um, I don't care if you're interested in old women or African American women or you know gay women, you know lesbian women. You know, there's someone in that story who you can cheer for, and that's really important. And the idea that we're cheering for people who are in prison in the first place is very provocative, I think. Hi, I'm Donna Bugert from the Cody Spark again, and I was wondering what was it like trying to learn the unspoken rules of prison and trying to socially adapt to the rest of the prisoners? I think you're. Uh, that question about the social ecology of a prison or a jail and how you adapt is pretty much, you know, that's the whole book <laughs> right there. Because uh, if you don't, if you sort of refuse to adapt and if you refuse to find your place within that social ecology, your prison sentence will be even harder than it needs to be. Um, and your recognition of your own humanity and the humanity of all those other people you're doing time with is really the fundamentally most important part of my own experience, and I think of you know millions of other people's experiences as well. Ivana Jang from Lakota East Spark again. Um, do you have any plans to extend the series or write anything further than Orange is the New Black? I do have a writing project in mind, which may bring me here to the great state of Ohio very soon, but I, I can't reveal much more about it. But. Um, my work remains focused on the criminal justice system, and that's the thing that I'm most work interested in writing about. So the next season, we have two seasons down. The next one's coming out <laughs> summer of 2015 uh, is what I was we, hearing. We have not yet set a release date for season three, not but I can yet. say that we're more than halfway through shooting it. Okay. Uh, the show is shot in New York where I live, which is lovely because I get to sort of drop in on the set. You know, mm -hmm. they're very sweet and open arms, and I get to go and watch them do their magic on set, which is fascinating to me. Um, it's amazing how many people it takes to make one hour of television. Yeah. <laughs> So any spoilers for us? I could Can you possibly, reveal anything for I us? I possibly reveal any spoilers. Okay. <laughs> Pfeiffer Kerman is the author of the memoir Orange is the New Black. Based on her personal experience of spending a year in prison, the memoir inspired the new, or I'm sorry, the Emmy-nominated Netflix series, which will be releasing its third season unannounced Sometime soon. Pfeiffer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. Thanks for tuning in to this special edition of Miami Television News. Make sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Miami TV News. I'm Katie Esplita. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.